So uh, this is the first panel. We're going to talk about theory and practice. We have uh, three fantastic people uh, doing work in the real world and research. Um, uh, and uh, we should, uh, uh, I think, uh, Cass suggested that we go Eitan, Sharad, Gilad. Uh, thank you, Sharad. It's not all Israelis uh, on this panel of various forms in, in various connections. We're all set. Um, uh, and so I think we should just uh, go ahead. Eitan, do you want to start? Great. Uh, so I'm Eitan Bakshi. I'm a data scientist at Facebook. I do a mixture of uh, basic and applied social science research. And I'm going to talk about some research that we do at Facebook and how it applies to um, social media and kind of political and economic outcomes that we care about. So Facebook is really large, right? We have a billion users, 600 million users logging in each day. And this is a gigantic data set. Everybody is excited about the, the possibility of these large data sets at Google and Twitter and Facebook. Uh, but what I think is most interesting uh, is not necessarily the data set itself, the network, but the dynamics that take place and the fact that we can run these randomized trials to understand human behavior online and to be able to apply our understanding of human behavior to the design of these systems. So my, my research mostly focuses on social influence and information diffusion in networks. So I'm going to sort of start from there as a, as a motivating uh, factor in things. So if we think about social networks, and here is a little toy model where we might imagine people's networks to be comprised of strong ties, so people with whom you interact with very frequently, who are more similar to you, and weak ties, who you interact with infrequently, it turns out that when it comes to, sorry, oh, it's not getting to the webcast. Is this okay? So when it comes to getting new information, let's say about finding a job, this information comes from weak ties. But OK, this is a simple model. Maybe this has something to do with getting a job. But what does it have to do with social media and how we get news, how we make former opinions? Well, so I ran this randomized trial with about pretty small sample size, maybe 250 million users. and. Um, <laughs> What we find is that people who are strong ties, so those that interact with one another frequently or are clustered in the network, tend to share the same content, even if they don't see their friends sharing that content in the feed. And they also tend to click on the same content and share and reshare that content. Whereas their weak ties, with whom they interact with less frequently, in terms of one-on-one -on -one communication, sending them messages, or being tagged in photos, are sharing information that's more diverse. The users would be very unlikely to share this information if they weren't exposed to it. And the thing is, and one of the, the main features of social media that's transformative is the fact that we're able to maintain such, such large networks, that the typical Facebook user might have 150 or 200 friends. Most people that are, you know, perhaps my age, college educated, might have you know, 600 friends. Very large networks. And so it turns out that even though these strong ties might be individually more influential, you're more likely to click on their content or reshare their content. There are so many more of these weak ties who have access to more diverse information or share more diverse information that collectively these weak ties are more influential. Now, OK, the, these people could be sharing soft news or pictures of kittens and things like that. What does this really have to do with important things, like exposure to political media or hard news? So um, this is a study that one of my colleagues, Salman Messig, uh, and um, Sean Westwood at Stanford conducted 
It's a, a, a lab experiment, or I guess it's a mechanical Turk experiment with about 900 users. And what they did is some subjects were randomly assigned to see articles from, let's say, Fox News or MSNBC. And what we find is that there is a lot of selective exposure. Liberals are less likely to click on conservative content and vice versa. But when they added these social cues, so in this case, these, these are not from their peers, but in general, it's just popularity information, a lot of this selective exposure disappears. And so these social cues have the potential to have a great deal of impact in terms of people's behavior. And it's not just behavior in terms of choosing to click on an article. These are real world outcomes like voting. So some of my colleagues at Facebook and UCSD uh, ran this, this randomized trial and kind of in line with what we did in 2008. Uh, in 2010, they did this thing where at the top of everybody's screen, if you're a US user over the age of 18, we showed either this, this message, you know, find your, your polling place, so linking users as to where to vote and uh, allowing users to declare that they voted, or doing the same thing, but with this additional social cues. So showing your peers who had said that they voted. And they found that, sure, people click on this I voted button more when we, we see these cues, but then since who votes is public, we're actually able to match that, and we found very substantial, I mean, very small effects, right? Like, 0.39% uh, probability increase of voting. But that translates to 1.2 million additional votes. And so this is an example of uh, an experiment that, uh, a randomized trial that I, I uh, helped run uh, this year, where in addition to this megaphone thing, this thing that appears at the top of your newsfeed, su suggesting or encouraging the individual to vote, we also show messages in feet. So there's this sort of viral aspect, and we're hoping that by increasing these amounts of peer signals and making it sort of a more authentic peer signal, you know, this resembles the, the kind of sharing behavior that users see in their newsfeed when people are sharing links and such, uh, we're hoping to get even greater mobilization. So yeah, I, that, that's it. I, I think Facebook is, is a great place to, to learn about uh, online behavior and uh, that information distribution through mediums like the news feed or the Twitter feed is a, a great way for people to learn about new things and that the addition of social context can um, sort of nudge people into uh, doing things that, um, you know, potentially more pro-social outcomes like voting. So. Great. Yep. Thanks. So this. Uh, <laughs> I neglected to say in advance, this was Eitan Bakshi from, uh, as a data scientist from uh, Facebook. Um, and next we have uh, Sharad Goel, who's a uh, computational social scientist uh, from Microsoft research. This is one of the things we find, is how much of the research is now done in social research labs. Uh, um, uh, as somebody working a lot in the field and certainly doing some collaborative work now also with Gilad, the amount of uh, fascinating work that's going on in the industrial labs is quite uh, substantial. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the structure, diffusion, and in particular this phrase, growing barrel. And uh, it's actually a really nice compliment to what Eitan was talking about, is it's an observational approach as opposed to an experimental approach to this question. So the, the motivating question is, how do ideas and products spread through society? And an answer that has emerged both in the academic literature over the last 50 years and as well as in popular culture over the last several hundred years is that, that ideas and products spread through connected populations like a biological contagion. So it starts, for example, it, at one node up here, it spreads to some of their contacts, then one of their contacts who becomes infected, to use that, that epidemiological analogy, 
you know, spreads it to their, their friends and so on and so on until we start just from one individual and at the end we have this large population of people who've been infected with this, this idea. So the question is, is this actually true? Is this how ideas spread through connected populations? And it's actually a really difficult question to answer because ideally you would like um, ideally, you like very high resolution data at the individual level. In contrast, the type of data that we generally have are, are aggregated at the population level. So this, this slide is the number of mentions of the phrase went viral in the New York Times. So it's, it's clearly a little bit of a joke, but <laughs> the, the point is, you know, this is exactly the type of aggregated population level data that, that people typically look at. And you look right here around 2009, and there's this big steep increase in the number of mentions of the phrase went viral. And so you look at it and you say, oh, well, went viral, went viral. So maybe that's true, maybe it's not. It's, it's hard to say, but this is literally what people have done for, for decades when trying to understand this question. So again, like I mentioned before, what we really want is this individual, high resolution, individual level data of when somebody becomes uh, infected and how they propagate this idea to their, their contacts and so on. Uh, well, it turns out that this is now pretty, uh, pretty easy to come by. It used to not be the case, but thanks to services like, like Facebook and Twitter, we have uh, quite a lot of this type of information. So um, we looked at six different, six different domains, and let me just in, give you a very brief overview of what, of what these domains are. Roughly, they're categorized into two different groups. One is a group where we directly infer diffusion of a product from one individual to the next, and the way we do that is we tag the URL. So here, um, this first one, let's look at it, it, Yahoo Kindness. This was a website where you come, you, you do something nice, for example, you pay the toll for the person behind you, um, you, you help somebody with their groceries, something like that. You do something nice, you post about this uh, on this site, and then you, you get a unique link, and then you pass this link on to your friends and hope, encourage them to do the same thing. And so every person who comes to the site, they get this unique identifier until we can tell exactly how this is propagating from one individual to the next, regardless of whether that's through email, through IM, through Facebook, whatever the means is we can, we can generally track what's happening. Then we have the second class of, of domains, um, for example, news stories and videos on Twitter, where we don't actually see, see explicit propagation of, of the product, but what we do see instead is adoption, a time series uh, uh, stamped of, of adoptions, where you see this person adopted the the new story, adopted the new story at this particular time, then their friends adopted it this other time. And we also get to see the network. So from the network and from these, uh, this time series of adoptions, we can infer what the diffusion pattern is. Uh, so we have, broadly speaking, these two types of, of domains. So now, the data are what most people focus on when they're, when they're talking about these types of questions, but I want to emphasize that there's actually a huge computational challenge that how do you, for example, analyze a million diffusion events over a billion edge, uh, a billion plus edge network? So this is this is Twitter, and that's actually a really tough question. But uh, over the last five to seven years, we have really uh, developed the uh, distributed parallel tools for solving these types of questions. So I'm not going to go into that in this talk, but I just want to point out that that almost all the attention is is on on the data side, but really the computational side is is actually a, there's there's a lot of exciting work going on there. Um, okay, so now what do we find? Remember, the the uh, hypothesis was that these things look viral, like a like a disease spreading through connected populations. So what do we actually find? We find this. Uh, so this is literally one node who's infected, and nothing happens. So 93% of the time, somebody adopts a news story, a video, something like that, and literally it dies out. So almost all of the adoption is just coming from these individual uh, events. So I can say, well, that's not terribly interesting. One person adopted, so I'm, I'm actually interested in, in at least products where something interesting happened. So conditional on something interesting happening, what do we see? Well, we again don't see very much. We see one node adopting, and then it spreads to one of their friends, and then it dies out. Again, conditional on something more interesting than this happening, what happens? One node adopts, one person uh, reads this news story, it spreads to two of their direct contacts, and so on. So 99% of the adoptions are really quite, quite boring. Um, so 99% of adoptions occur within one step of the seed. So whatever your definition of viral is, it's probably not this. So almost all the adoptions are not spreading virally. So rather that somebody somebody reads this news story and then you know that's it. They don't share, and that's 
you know, in, in some sense that has to be the case. If it were the case that this were spreading all over the place virally all the time, would be overloaded with uh, information. And so just a basic economic argument saying that we have limited attention precludes anything significant happening a lot of the time. Um, okay, so roughly diffusion is about one step propagation. And on average, we see two free adoptions for every 10 independent adoptions. So by free here, I mean viral adoptions. So if you get 10 people on average to, uh, or 10 people to, to adopt, on average, we get two, two viral or unpaid adoptions. So you know, marketers beware, there's no free lunch. You know, if you're looking for hush puppies, you're probably out of luck. Uh, but a free snack is nothing to complain about. So 20% is not, is not that bad. Um, okay, well, the real question now is, does anything go viral? And we have a lot of, uh, I think we have a lot of intuitive sense that this, this is happening. We see all of these popular uh, videos on, on YouTube, and we really have a strong sense that there's something must be going viral. How do these obscure videos, obscure products actually gain popularity? In, in the first part of this, this presentation, I've tried to make the argument that almost none of the time this is happening, so does this ever happen? And what's interesting is there's very little direct evidence of, of viral diffusion, even though we all have a strong sense that this is happening. And really here is, uh, is Gungam style, for example, going viral. You know, this is the canonical example these days. And, and just to say we have to sign this rather draconian copyright clause when we agreed to present here. And so I do own the copyright for this, <laughs> just, to, just to, to be clear for everybody on the, uh, on the webcast. Um, <laughs> And so this is a, it's a drawn version of, of, <laughs> of Psy. So this, this is original. Um, OK, so the question is, does this, does this actually go, did this actually go viral? And now we immediately run into this question, what does going viral even mean? And there's lots of different ways to interpret this phrase. So the, the one that I'm going to focus on here is a structural definition of virality, where the two extreme examples are a broadcast version where somebody uh, somebody adopts and then broadcasts it to a bunch of their, their neighbors. And here you can think of maybe a major news organization or, or uh, a, a popular celebrity on, on Twitter. So that's one way in which information is spread versus this, this uh, alternative, which is much more akin to an epidemic-like biological spread of, of information where it starts at one individual, spreads to their friends, and so on through, through many ge generations. So this is, this is a structural distinction, and there are many other uh, ways to think about virality. For example, it's, it's innate contagiousness, which is one of the ways that, that epidemiologists often address this problem, but I'm going to focus on the structural definition of virality. So now, uh, in, the, in the first part, I was, I was talking about a million events, roughly, which is, which is large for, for social science standards. So now we're going to bump this up to a billion events, and, and why is that? Um, well. If things go viral, they're probably happening very rarely. We already know, again, just from this back of the envelope calculation, that it can't be happening too often, or else we'd be inundated with information. So we're going to look at every, uh, we're going to trace the diffusion of nearly every news story, video, photograph, and petition on Twitter for 12 months. So that's about a billion pieces of content. And we're going to look in this huge haystack for these possible needles of viral diffusion. So now, what do we find? Well, here are six, six samples. Uh, and this is, this is a pretty amazing um, picture in my mind for several reasons. First, just looking at this one picture here, this is pretty viral. You know, whatever your definition of viral is, you know, if it's a structural definition or whatnot, this is, this is a viral event. There are thousands of, of adopters spreading over you know, several generations, many generations, and it looks like no single individual is responsible for what's happening here versus here, this is a pure broadcast. So we, we do find viral events, that's the first thing. The second is, these are ordered by this, this definition of structural virality, which I didn't give you the formal definition in the interest of time, but these are ordered by that definition of structural virality, and so we can see that that ordering does make sense. Again, whatever your intuitive notion of virality is, this roughly corresponds, I would claim, with that intuitive notion. So this is, this is not a hand-selected ordering, this is our algorithmic ordering of, of virality. So our measure is capturing this. The third is that we see extreme uh, diversity. So not only do we have these broadcasts and these viral extremes, but we see everything in between. And again, that's not obvious that that exists. Even at the beginning of this talk, it was clear that this it was clear that we could see broadcast diffusion. It wasn't clear that this existed. We had contenders. We had things like Gungam style where this potentially could exist. 
And, but we didn't know for sure that this existed. And even more surprising to me is that we, we certainly didn't know these, this middle continuum actually existed. So we see, uh, we, we see a very smooth transition from broadcast to viral. Um, and then finally, below each of these plots, this is probably a little bit hard to see uh, in the audience, but these are these cumulative adoption plots analogous to the, the went viral plot uh, in, the, in the New York Times that I showed earlier. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but roughly all of these exhibit the exact same rapid increase in number of adoptions, and then it just levels off while it saturates the population. And the point is that this is exactly how people have attempted to look at, uh, attempted to quantify virality in the past using these types of plots, and they're all roughly the same. And so these plots are, are missing this huge structural diversity that we see in events. Okay, so just to show me, show you a couple more, more pictures, um, this is about a one in a 10,000 event. So one in 10,000 is that it's large, but in fact, large uh, doesn't mean viral. It's a couple different, a couple broadcasts. So this is about a one in 10,000 event. And again, the, the zeroth slide in this, in this series is 99% of the time, nothing happens. It literally is one node. But this is about a one in 10,000 event, a large event. This is about a one in 100,000 event where it's, you know, it's, Pretty big, but it's also uh, multi-generational, pretty, pretty viral. And now here's a, a one in a million event where it's large and actually viral unambiguously by any definition. So this is so really these viral events that we that we believed existed before, they do in fact exist, and we're seeing them about a one in a million times. And this is why in our previous study, which looked at order a million events, we never saw these types of examples, and why it's very important that we looked at a billion events. So this seems large and it seems like we're just, in a sense, showing off that we can do it at this scale. But in fact, if you're looking for one in a million events, arguably you need about a billion observations before you can do this just to have a thousand examples, which if you're trying to understand the structure and in particular the structural diversity of these events, that's a, a sample of a thousand, I would say, is, is the bare minimum you would need to, to study this. So a billion events to start out with is, is certainly not gratuitous for the, the question that we're looking at. Um, okay. So the, the final point I want to make is that, that going back to Gangnam Style, these really, really popular events, there's in, in, the, in the media, there's, there's often this conflation between popular, large versus viral. And to give one extreme example, the Super Bowl is popular, but we wouldn't call that viral. And so now, what can we say? Are these popular events really viral? Well, in, in the extreme year, here are the largest events we see, about, about 30,000. Uh, adopters and in this video's domain and on the the y-axis we just have structural virality so the higher it is the more viral it is by by our measure and what we see is that these events these largest events really are viral by our measure uh, but in fact a lot of these smaller events these medium-sized <coughs> events around a thousand three thousand there's actually a lot of them which are viral up here but there are a lot of them which are not very viral they, which are basically broadcast so the 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 way to think about this is when something becomes really, really large, it's almost certainly viral. And again, this almost has to be the case because there aren't broadcast channels which are large enough to accommodate events the size of Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style literally had over a billion views on Facebook. You know, how many people watch the Super Bowl? I don't know, 100 million maybe? So it's, you just literally don't have broadcast channels that can accommodate that type of information propagation. So you have to have something else at play there. What's interesting here is we are seeing events which are significantly smaller than these massive Gangnam style uh, size events, which are still almost certainly viral. But then in the middle ground, where things are, are large, they can either be broadcast or viral. And, and you often don't have, uh, you often can't say much beyond that from size alone. So to summarize, the vast majority of adoptions are not viral. Again, 99% of adoptions are just coming from single, uh, individuals adopting and not sharing this. And so the vast majority of the time you can think of this as uh, like playing the lottery that you're not gonna win. You can play and you're just not gonna win most of the time and that's the intuition that you wanna have for almost all of your business decisions. But as a pure sort of matter of, 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 of curiosity, if nothing else, viral events do exist but are rare, about one in a million. And so our intuition is correct that these events exist. It's just I would say that probably we, we didn't quite understand how rare these events actually are. Uh, the structural diversity is extreme going from broadcast to viral. We see a full continuum of, uh, uh, of structure between that. And 
except at these extremes, size is not a strong indicator of virality. When it's really small, you of course know it's not viral. When it's one guy who adopted, you know, what are you gonna say? The structure is just, it is what it is. When it's huge, you again know that it, it almost has to be viral and we find evidence that that is, is the case, but anywhere in between, you can't make strong statements. If something is, is medium big, it may have been a broadcast, it may have been viral, and we have very little information about, about what the actual mechanism of diffusion was in that case. And now, again, just final uh, summary. I, this is one example of, of what uh, I think of as computational social science, where you combine social science, computational tools, and large-scale observational data. And I've, I've hoped I've convinced you that this, is, this gives us some better understanding of human behavior. Thanks. Great, thank you. And uh, last of these three is Gilad Lotan, who's uh, VP of Research and Development at Social Flow, working a lot on Twitter, and uh, um, looking forward to hearing. All right, I'm just gonna sit here and uh, do this real fast. So I'm Gilad, I'm a data scientist at a New York City startup called Social Flow. Uh, we're much, much, much smaller than these guys, but we also have a, sort of a small research crew that does a lot of data analysis, uh, and, and we try to look at uh, many of these types of information diffusion problems, and uh, we do a lot of audience modeling. So we work very closely with both Twitter and Facebook. We consume something that's called the Twitter Firehose, so any publicly posted update uh, to Twitter comes through our systems. And I want to start actually by um, telling you a little story. So I recently moved to a, a bigger apartment in New York City. I know it's, it's pretty great. Uh, and I finally have enough space to have a piano. So what did I do, like all of us would do, I go online, go to Google, and look for upright pianos. I want a used one. It's actually, I don't know if any of you have ever like, bought a piano, but it's actually such a hard thing. There's so many types, so many models. Even within the models, you have the serial number. So it's actually really hard. So I started obsessively researching pianos. It didn't take long before the piano started follow, following me everywhere I go online. So now when I go to YouTube, I get ads for pianos. When I read the news, I get ads for pianos. And even when I go to Mashable to consume my cat humor, I get pianos. So really, this, this sort of went from frustration to, to almost a, f a feeling of like pity. Is this really where we've become? Is like cookie-based targeting, which is what it's like, the, the, the thing that everyone talks about, how we know people's intent, so then we can like, figure out exactly which ads to serve them. But, but actually, this type of, of, of uh, behavior, yes, I, I do have an intent. I do want to buy a piano, but I'm not ready yet. So why, why do you have to keep following me? And the interesting thing that we're seeing with social media now and the data that we get from social media uh, is, is changing that, and I think it's really interesting. So obviously, I, I don't think I have to explain in this room why social media is, is very different. Um, we have, uh, uh, it's changing uh, the rules in a way, making information much more spreadable much faster, right? Information spreads much, much faster through social networks. Uh, we have ability to measure things we've never been able to measure before, and I'll give you some examples of the types of signals that we look at that I think are, are fairly interesting. This shift to a network nature, right? The network nature of this medium means that also there's a shift in power. Like we've seen uh, in Tunisia, we've seen in Egypt, and many of these events that are happening. It's, it's, it, these, these mediums are giving sort of loosely connected groups a much more powerful way to, to, to connect and have an audience. Uh, and then uh, what a lot of us talked about is information scarcity, uh, uh, attention scarcity, sorry. So it's very, you, you cannot command or demand someone's attention within these spaces. You have to really understand how things spread, understand the lay of the land and the network nature uh, of how people are interconnected to, to really to, to sort of make the best decisions as to like how, how to message these audiences. So let me give you a really a, a, a recent example from a few days ago. This shows uh, the number of tweets posted with the word power or Super Bowl. These are public tweets, so uh, content that was po posted publicly to Twitter. And when you look at Super Bowl, Super Bowl is in green, you sort of see this, okay, events sort of have a little rise, and then when the event starts, you see a spike, and that makes sense. Uh, but note the, the, the significant change in, in w what people were attentive to when the power goes out, right? So massive spike in people talking about the power outage shift from Super Bowl to power outage. Obviously, this is a fairly big event, 
uh, this is not, at these levels, this is not you know, as common. Uh, but, but this type of attention shift happens all the time, all the time at different varying level, uh, scales. And what's sort of the big talk this week has been how people use this information and use these events. So uh, I don't know if many of you read all the articles about Oreo sort of putting out an ad in real time saying, okay, power outage, you know, it took them a few minutes, I think, to make the ad, but they put it, made it relevant to the context of what people were attentive to at that point in time, right? So, so this, is, this is like really powerful and, and I'm glad we had this example uh, a few days ago because I think it really highlights the, uh, the ability that uh, we have now with uh, social, uh, social media and data coming from social networks. Here's to give you a, a, just a different example. We have uh, uh, three different events that happen at the same time. Again, this is Twitter data. So, uh, the uh, one curve uh, represents Marcha anti EPN, that's a social movement, uh, uh, an event that happened in Mexico City. Um, the, the red curve is the TV show True Blood, and the green, the Tony Awards, right? Each, each event has a different curve. And this is before we do anything complicated, any entity extraction, you know, topic analysis. This is just looking at the shape of the data. Um, so by now, we've amassed such a, a, a such a large data set of all these events, just by looking at its shape, we can make pretty good guesses as to what the event is. This is before even looking at, uh, uh, at what people are talking about. Um, here's a different uh, type of metric that we think is really interesting. Um, so this maps out audience activity, right? People who follow Pepsi versus people who follow the AP versus people who follow Al Jazeera English have very different activity curve. Al Jazeera is much wider because geographically the audience is, is sort of distributed uh, widely around the world versus Pepsi and the AP, it's sort of much more North America. Uh, and notice, notice these spikes that happen. So when Pepsi puts out a promotion, their audience rises in participation. Uh, when uh, breaking news happens, so in this case it's Whitney Houston's death announced, everything spikes. So right, so a lot of what we do is, is by understanding what the norm is for an audience for an event, and by measuring the difference from the norm or how, how things deviate from the norm, we can actually get at, try to get at the effect uh, that the real world event had on a, a group of people, an audience. Uh, to give you another, uh, another example, uh, this sort of looking at the network nature of this medium, uh, this is an example uh, of an analysis we ran on uh, the Kony 2012 video that went uh, viral, I'll say quote unquote viral, um, last year. And um, the, the interesting story about this, this is before Gangnam Style, so this was the you know, most viral piece of content we'd ever seen within a few days, 100 million views, like that's massive. Um, and I think that the big story was uh, in the media that, oh, this, this video was put on YouTube, uh, passed on through Facebook and Twitter and what, what, what you um, like passed on through people and really went viral. But when you actually look at the structure of the network of people who initially posted the video, you get a very, uh, 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 you sort of see these patterns, these very distinct clusters emerge within this group. So when you actually dive into these groups, and this, is, this plot represents uh, the first uh, 20,000 people who posted the video, uh, to Twitter and how they're interconnected and then clustered by that. So groups that are, that are dense here are groups that are very much interconnected. And when you dive into these segments, you sort of see that uh, uh, they're um, clustered by geography. So there's, a there's two dense groups in Pittsburgh, one in Oklahoma City, one in Noblesville, Indiana, uh, Birmingham, Alabama has a big one. And, and as, you, as we dive into these profiles, we also see their um, Many of their uh, bios uh, reference biblical psalms and talk about Jesus and God, etc. So you can clearly identify a very distinct clustered group of people. These are students uh, with religious affiliation who, who were set in place. It's almost as this network was set in place at the beginning of this sort of viral event, right? So, in a way, this, this video, it, it's not that it you know, was placed online and went viral, but uh, it was the, the group Invisible Children had sort of been working for years with all these, uh, um, all these schools and all these universities across the country and generating ties, and it, this was very planned. I mean, there was, um, 
there was sort of a message sent out to all of them saying, you know, 9 a.m. this day, use this hashtag, post this video, and everyone posted at the same time. So it's sort of a really great example of leveraging the power of, of these network mediums where when you light up different parts of the network at the same time, there's much more likelihood that something uh, will be spreadable or spread because it trends locally in all these different regions. Um, it's just a different way to, to, uh, uh, that, we measured, um, that we measured the effect of this video. What this graph shows is um, what we call audience volatility. So um, it's looking at how, how different the trends are throughout the day. So when you see uh, uh, effectively how focused are people on one topic or whether there's a, a ton of things going on at the day, uh, the, if, if the audience is less focused, the sort of curve goes higher. If it's much more focused, the curve goes lower. And if we looked at sort of a period of six months of, of trends, we see that the absolute lowest point um, across the network was the day Kony 2012 went out. So reaching this super, super level of focus, right? And the, the interesting thing is that using this data, we can now uh, quantify the amount of focus for, um, that we're seeing in the network based on an event. Um, so I think this is where I'm going to uh, leave it off so we have uh, time for discussion. Um, yeah. Well, great. Thanks. Three fascinating presentations. Um, I'm supposed to take a few minutes to just say a few words about these and connect it a little bit to the work we're doing here. And then uh, we'll have about uh, 15 minutes or so uh, for Q&A. Um, so actually, the, the presentations present beautifully some of the core aspects of computational social science as we're also seeing it here and also begin to raise the normative questions we need to ask in this context. So um, let's start with the promise of computational social science in the behavioral context. Um, and the first is this use of large-scale observational data to understand how people behave beyond their self-interest or how people behave pro-socially or how people uh, behave uh, effectively. So uh, on the side of, of using large-scale observational data um, and thinking of its relationship to experiments, uh, one of the pieces of work that's useful for thinking about this that, that uh, Mako Hill and Aaron Shaw have done here in the cooperation group uh, with me has been looking at barn stars in Wikipedia, whether or not if you give a barn star contribution rises or falls. And essentially what the present allows us is to have every single edit by every single editor throughout the whole history of Wikipedia connected to whether or not they received the barn star or gave a barn star and who gave it to them and who they co-edited with, et cetera. So you actually get a full picture. And this gave us this, this last summer in the uh, American Sociological Association, we had an interesting panel in which one presentation was um, uh, somebody who had done an experiment of just handing out barn stars. And lo and behold, as surprise, the people who got uh, barn stars increased participation. Easy, simple, not true. Not true in the sense that when we actually have all of the data on every single barn star given to every single person with all of their editing history, almost everybody declines after a barn star because they get it at the peak of activity. But more interestingly, there are two completely different kinds of people. There are signalers who put the barn star on their personal page. And there are non-signalers who just basically, they don't ignore it, it's there, they've edited the page, but that's not what they're trying to use. The effect is positive for those who are signalers and basically not there for people who aren't. That's what the realism of the observational, the completeness of the observational data gives us a certain kind of realism that allows us to really challenge. But the experiments also, uh, but the other thing, that was method, but the, but the substance is that people are diverse. People are quite different from each other. Social signalers will respond in one way, others uh, in another way. So for example, in the experiments, Aitan, that you were describing about how you frame in terms of how realistic the social structure is of saying, I voted, the next step, of course, is saying some people would respond more like this and others like that, and the, and the profile changes. Then there's the question of the, the cleanliness of the experiments. 
Here, I think one of the fascinating things, what Jerome is now working on uh, here, and if you want to talk to him about it later, um, 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 uh, it's worthwhile, is basically what we have is over about 900 Wikipedians who run through a standard online set of uh, uh, standard behavioral experiments of trust and public goods games, et cetera, measuring prosociality, but alongside their full editing history in an actual prosocial setting and allowing us to actually calibrate between reality and uh, experimentation. And so one of the things that's very powerful is A, the relative ease and inexpensiveness of online uh, experimentation relative to the physical lab uh, uh, down the street, uh, and the other is the connection between real world individual behavior and clean experimental behavior that's giving us tremendous insights, in this case, on the relative role and limitations of reciprocity and social signaling at the individual level. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then there's just sheer scale. Just sheer scale. If you have a one in a million phenomenon that's significant, you need a billion instances. You can't get that except when you have this full record of actual lived experience um, uh, uh, throughout uh, uh, in, in, in reality. Um, so if we have essentially experiments that are cheaper to run, one more thing, the thing you can do, and that's connected uh, specifically to the uh, experiment, the first of the experiments you were describing. There's a difference between a lab experiment or an Amazon Mechanical Turk experiment that's clean and just sort of abstracted, and an experiment in real world, in real context, that's a field experiment. And you can do both, and they're quite different in the extent to which they're valid and the, and the extent to which, and those are both. Uh, 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 so for example, again, in our group, Mako Hill and Andreas Monroy working with Scratch, which Andreas uh, 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 was at the source, looking at the way in which different, way, different affordances of communication between the million or so kids who were uh, online in this uh, 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 collaborative creation environment changed the degree to which they were happy to share their creation with others and let others build on their own work versus be annoyed that others are using them. Um, but this also leads us to uh, the threat of uh, behavioral economics generally and behavioral economics and social media specifically uh, that um, um, uh, Gilad's opening uh, ex expressed so well with the story of the piano, which is to say, yes, in principle, this, we could be using this to learn about pro-social behavior. We could be using this about getting people to, to um, um, uh, save more for retirement. Uh, but the critical characteristic of the behavioral turn in the social sciences is the action upon people, the deviation from self-understanding and self-awareness uh, uh, self and autonomy, and the fact that behavior can be predicted based on the situation. Uh, so what we have essentially is the threat to autonomy. Um, and the better we get, the, the beauty of social science is that we are getting better and better at understanding at an individualized level how these general mechanisms that we've identified in the literature today actually, given the diversity of individuals, change from person to person. The better we get at that, just like the pianos started showing up, the manipulations and framings, there's no reason why it's limited to putting pianos in front of you as opposed to designing the full situational context of your behavior on a person-by-person -person individualized basis on the basis of millions of transactions you've run uh, over time. So that in our advances, and we need to understand this as people working within the behavioral sciences on social uh, behavior online, the better we get, the better we are able to let governments and firms shape our behavior down to the level of our beliefs in the situation, our situational preferences, our situational policies, our situational principles, because all of these are shaped by our understanding of uh, the situations. In other words, you had power uh, rising up there, but this is power essentially shifting uh, toward a very well-defined mechanism for shaping behaviors by whoever holds the data and whoever knows how to connect it. And I think that's a real moral, normative, ultimately will be legal challenge that we have to deal uh, with uh, as we look. So we have about 15 minutes for questions.
Yeah, Mason. Uh, yeah, so um, one thing that came out in a lot of your presentations was this. Uh, oh, thank you. That makes it easier. Um, so one thing that came out in your presentation was this connection between um, social network clustering and you know what you might call, for lack of a better term, real world clustering. Like uh, your close friends are likely to click on the same things and have the same interests, or you know you had these uh, clusters by region. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's also like you know age and profession and so on. I'm wondering if you've seen a trend of social networking clustering to either diffuse or reinforce these kind of real world clusters, and if so, what implication that has for the way the existence of social networks are changing our behavior? So, um, so what what are some particular examples of clusters that? Uh, Social media might influence. Oh, well, I was about to say, so, um, or what? What did you have in mind? I should oh, say. So you know, these ideas. So you have um, social network clustering that reflects uh, you know, particular cities or regions. Mm -hmm. You probably also have clusters that reflect particular professions and schools. And I was wondering if those clusters are getting more diffuse, or if they're getting, uh, or, or, or if those clusters are getting reinforced as as, so, as adoption of social networks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're seeing more and more long-range ties on Facebook. So uh, especially because we have this ability to maintain sort of these weak tie connections. So I think it does, in, in some sense, reduce the amount of clustering. Uh, at the same time, if you look at a medium like Twitter, uh, it sort of gives you this instant channel to form this cluster around a particular topic. Uh, so I think in, in that kind of respect, and I think this is partly the difference between kind of an, more of an interpersonal network like Facebook versus um, Twitter, which is um, interest, kind of interest is, is a, a little bit more interest based uh, and a little bit less kind of interpersonal. So, so I, can, I can talk to that because uh, a lot of times what we do is um, an event happens uh, and, and then we make a mapping of okay, all the people who participated in the event or all the people who responded to this thing that happened, what, what does this look like? Who are they? How are they interconnected? And many times the ties between them, and this is on Twitter, uh, which represents, it's not, it's not social ties, but it's sort of interest ties. You choose to follow someone because you're interested in them. Uh, that highlights some really interesting properties. So if you run sort of modularity on these graphs and you, you get these distinct, distinct clusters, Sometimes they're, uh, they're by location, so like the Coney 2012 example. Sometimes they're by interest. It could be profession. It could be people who are you know, interested in whatever, um, doing one thing versus another. Uh, but but there's definitely, we definitely see these clusters almost always, always emerge. Uh, so I, I would say it, it really depends on the age of, of you know, the participants. The younger they are, the more likely the clusters are uh, geographically oriented. Uh, and then the older sort of they are, the more professional circles there are. It's, it's usually topical. Let me, I can add one thing. So it's actually a really interesting question because you have these two countervailing forces. On the one hand, with, with the relative ease of being able to connect to anyone you want, you could say, oh, well, we have this possibility of weak ties to a hugely diverse population, and so on, in that sense, we should be much more diverse. And we, we, we might predict that homophily would decrease with, with all these social networking platforms. But on the other hand, with all of these options, you could say people become more insular, right? Now I can find exactly the people who share my very particular political beliefs. I can find the people who share my very particular tastes in, in music and art, and I can just interact with these individuals. And so this isn't a question that I, that I've looked at empirically, but I think it's you know it's 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 a very interesting one because it's not obvious. You know, it, it's not obvious which way the the coin is going to fall. Like at the end of the day, we're going to see greater uh, greater homogeneity, greater homophily emerging from social networking platforms, or if we're actually going to see a decrease. Does this fall out of your uh, of of the experiment you were describing with regard to Fox News? Um, um, that that experiment seems to speak to this question. Well, well, so so that that experiment is a, a lab experiment that um, one of my collaborators did at Stanford. Uh, but I, I think I could I could speak a little bit to this point about clustering, um, which once again I think this, this sort of relates back to the the nature of the network. Uh, I think 
in a, an interpersonal network like Facebook, uh, you, you connect to your friends, people who um, your, the basis for your interaction isn't purely interest-based, right? I, I'm not friends with this person um, just because you know, we're interested in statistics or um, you know, ecology or something. Um, but on Twitter, the, there is like a, a much more focused tendency to, you know, only follow people who are who are uh, have the same interests. And when you look at networks, let's say of, um, you know, you, political bloggers, you know, you you see this like these these two kind of polarized hairballs on Twitter or in the blogosphere. But if you look at a, a Facebook social network and how political affiliations are are clustered along along that network, you actually find quite a bit of mixing. Or you find that um, there is some clustering, but the user is connected to uh, multiple conservative and liberal clusters. So I think there, there's this tendency when we have uh, networks that reflect real, real world networks um, more than just this purely online social network for you to have um, kind of less strong clustering. I'll push back on the interpretation of the political blogs, but I think not on this. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's a little bit different. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Can we have a? Hi, thanks. Can you help me understand this from a marketing perspective? When I was listening to your conversation, I couldn't help but think of um, a panel at the Kennedy School between. Um, the uh, officials at the Obama campaign and officials at the Romney campaign that took place a couple of days after the election. And one of the things that came out of that was that in the Romney campaign, they were looking for the magic bullet, right? It's, it's social media. If we're just better on social media, we'll win the election. Meanwhile, the Obama campaign had an old fashioned, well, not necessarily old fashioned, but put a lot of energy into the ground game um, going house to house, seeing people, which turned out to be the difference for them in a lot of places. So when I listen to you, though, it seems like the biggest events happen often in places where people have been on the ground doing the face-to-face -face work, like the Coney 2012 example that, that you gave. So what's the takeaway for marketers who are thinking about the social media sphere here because it, it sounds basically like what you're saying is, you guys are going to do great on social media if you're doing all the other stuff great anyway in the first place, rather than if you guys are great in social media, you know this can unlock kind of a world of of possibilities for you outside of all of the other stuff that you're doing. Um, so I, I can make a couple comments and maybe Clark can follow up that. So there, there are two interpretations of what it means to be great on social media. I mean, one is that you're just going to activate some audience that you might not ordinarily have access to. For example, in this in the political sphere, you might be able on Facebook to to energize uh, a group of people who you you simply can't get to in other ways. And I, th I think that's that's completely plausible. The the other sense though is is uh, more akin to viral activation, right? That you're going to spend some relatively small amount of money. You know, targeting a certain cluster of people, and then you're going to hope that they're going to do all the work from there. And that I I don't think is is going to be where you're going to get the traction that that we've found repeatedly in a variety of domains that we're seeing almost you know it's it's surprisingly consistent that we're seeing around 20 30 percent uh, return in, in terms of you get one person to activate, and on average you're getting about 20 percent more that that get this message viral. And so that's two very different interpretations of why you would want to use social media to, to spread your message. One, trying to get it for free, which, you know, again, I'm not very um, keen on that idea, although it, you should leverage to the extent that it is, is possible. But the, the other, which is much more, much more reasonable, is simply to get access to people that you can't get access to in another way. So I would say, I, th I would say the, the, and I'm not a marketer, but the marketing jargon that I've heard, it, describing exactly what you're saying is earned and paid. So earned and paid media, earned and paid audience. Uh, and how this breaks down in, in social networks is the earned uh, audience or the earned media is, is you know your existing audience, your existing con constituents. 
how do you how do you get to know them better and how do you understand what topics interest them um, when they're active and basically be able to sort of hone in on that and make sure they're happy and they continue to grow happy in quotes uh, on the other side we have the paid uh, audience and, and media side where by by sort of uh, uh, understanding a, maybe a, a network of people or, or folks who are outside of your existing network or existing audience, but uh, um, really getting to know what they're interested in, what they talk about, where they hang out, what, where they, you know, literally where you can put ads or which doors you can knock on to go outside this network and effectively like pay for these spaces. Uh, so in online spaces, it's like, it's ads. So putting, you know, ads on pages of people who like you know, this, you know, brand in this city because you sort of know that that's the type of population you want to grow. So it's two very different types of, of growth uh, mechanisms. And I think that most folks sort of take a mixed approach, make sure they continue to grow their own audience, but also figure out which parts uh, are missing and where they should, how, how they can, you know, pay to, to gain, gain their attention. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, Brian from Northeastern. So uh, this is, give me just a second for an exposition. So this is a question about the assumptions of like homogeneity and heterogeneity and the sort of social systems that we see around us and the, the how these sort of bake in assumptions about how we understand how the world operates. And so that in a lot of the sorts of the phenomena that we're interested in the world, th there's a central tendency that people have a certain weight, you know, everyone's between 100 or 200 pounds or between five foot and six foot. But the stuff that you sort of delved into here shows that there's extreme levels of sort of head, uh, high levels of heterogeneity, extreme levels of, of diversity. And so how does this then sort of affect the sort of the experimental and the statistical approaches that you use? And, and um, especially uh, in, in, in the individual capacities that people have, and so that people have very different sorts of capacities. And so as, how does this influence then this diversity influence our ability to analyze social behavior? How does this sort of influence who we target and sort of social systems? And, uh, and how, do, how do we sort of develop policy? Should we be focusing on people in the sort of the long tail, the sort of the stars? Or should we be focusing on the sort of the people in the short tail, the sort of the large herd of people? And I think as Professor Bankler mentioned, this is a sort of a very strong sort of moral and normative sort of question, but it was something I wanted to sort of come back to about in these sorts of extreme sorts of distributions of activity uh, in, the, in the organizations that you work in, do you see more attention in sort of the long tail or the short tail? Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a big question. Um, it, I, on one hand, it, it certainly affects the statistical analysis, right? If you, if you think of things as, as being normally distributed, which is what a lot of analyses do, then the types of events that, that I was showing, for example, these are, you know, six sigma events. They just, you wouldn't see them, and your models are all going to break down, and they're just, it's, it's the wrong framework. But in, in a variety of domains, we're now used to dealing with these heavy-tailed distributions, and it really changes the way that you're going to do inference. It, it changes the, the size of the samples that you need to, to look at. Um, again, just tying it back to, to what I presented, it's, it's, you know, if you were to do with ordinary, uh, an example, or an ordinary analysis, you would just say viral events don't exist, right? You look at a million events, you don't see anything, you know, you can, you just, you'd say, the, you, you really, if you look at the size distribution of those events, you'd say, oh, well, there's no way we're going to see these hugely viral events, but of course we do, and so that's, it's just a, a very different, different population. Um, and there are all sorts of implications, the financial industry is probably one of the best, best known examples in, in these black swan type events, they have huge, huge implications. I'm not an expert in that, so maybe I, I won't say too much more, but. Uh, I, can, I can touch the personalization aspect of, of your question, and I think, I mean, I think it's a really important question that you, that you raise. Um, like we, we have, um, so we have these automatic systems, right, in, set in place. A lot of them, even in, in news sites, sort of top stories, what's popular and personalized by, you know, your friends or what you've, you've liked in the past. And um, the question is, like, a, a, lot of these uh, a lot of these systems, these automated systems, like, here's an example, tr uh, Twitter's trending topics, right, tells you, okay, what's trending within your region, there, there's certain uh, uh, algorithms that are pretty commonly used to, to figure out uh, uh, 
what what is a trend, what is the top thing, and um, it's sort of it's these decisions of which algorithms we use is mostly sort of done within you know a group of data scientists trying to like help the product have this feature and there there isn't um, there aren't as many processes set in place to figure out what are the what what are the implications on on what types of content, because of these algorithmic choices, what types of content people see or not see. To be more specific, uh, I'll give you an example of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, uh, when it uh, really took off uh, in New York City, that term, Occupy Wall Street, trended everywhere around the world, never in New York City, because of the type of algorithm that trends use. It, it, it sort of promotes novel or sp uh, content that spikes, like Kim Kardashian's wedding, uh, but doesn't, uh, uh, things that sort of slowly grow, like Occupy, will never actually reach um, trends. So, so what, are, what are these implications uh, of, of these personalized sort of algorithm, uh, algorithms that we use in these spaces? And how do we optimize for um, like an informed public rather than traffic? And I don't know the answer to that. So, yeah, I mean, maybe I could sort of speak to dealing with crazy distributions or um, kind of how do we deal with heterogeneity. Uh, so I, I think when you when you first start out uh, like at an internet company, I think when I was like first doing research uh, at Yahoo in, in Sharad's lab uh, and you know any sort of intern data scientist at Facebook, you'll always see these power law plots or things that look like log normal distributions that might actually be normally distributed when you log transform them. Um, so that's often like a simple fix, uh, especially if you're just doing like regression. Um, but you, you really have to be sensitive toward these things. And you know it often makes sense to condition on, on some of these variables and do breakdowns. Uh, and I, I definitely find in most of my analyses that there is heterogeneity of treatment effects, and that's a really important thing to account for. Um, and th this is another reason why I think randomization is good and um, a major problem that you could have in observational analysis. So if we were to just look at, um, you know, if we were to condition on, you know, how many stars somebody received, you're, you're then, um, you know, this is a collider variable, and like then you know it's it's not really clear what's causing what. Whereas if you have randomization, then we can look at certain subpopulations and sort of see how the the treatment differentially affects certain types of individuals. Um. So individualization individuation resists. Uh, aggregation, but resistance is futile. Uh, we've reached the end of our <laughs> uh, time. Thanks very much to our panelists. <laughs>